Hola. Um, how do I sound? I, for the first time uh, after doing like 13, 14, what, so, so many of these videos, I think I've posted that many, but uh, there's actually more that'll come out before this. So by the time you watch, I don't know how many, uh, and I never even bothered once to look into, you know, how to actually properly use the mic that I have. So um, I've changed some settings and I think that uh, I might be doing a better job now. Um, so hopefully the audio sounds all right to you. And hopefully I won't have any more of those issues where it gets too loud uh, and buzzes and stuff. What's that called? I don't remember. Um, anyways, I've got another uh, picture book library haul here today. Um, I was really happy with the books that I got this week. A lot of good ones. Ones that'll go on my wish list, actually. Um, and so um, here they are from my least favorite one up to my most favorite one. Okay, so the first one here is... Uh, I Doko, The Tale of a Basket by Ed Young. Um, this story is fine. It's the way that it's written that was uh, the problem for me. It's, it's This is not a particularly negative review, but it's still my least favorite because of this issue. So um, it might seem like a small thing when I state it uh, here, but the, the issue I think stems from the fact that um, this is a story told from the perspective of a basket that is... Um, owned by a family, and uh, it kind of recounts the tale of this basket's use um, throughout the generations of this family. The thing that's weird is it names the initial character, and then it says that that character has a son, and then it never names that son, but that son has a son who is named. So then, for the rest of the story, there's various interactions between these characters. One of them, uh, two of them are uh, referred to by their name, and the other one is referred to all sorts of different ways because he never got a name. It's referred to as the one character's father, the other character's son, and I think at some points, just the boy, or a boy, yeah. Um, and uh, perhaps I was reading this too quickly, but... Um, but as I was reading through it, I became confused as to who they were talking about and who was related to who and what was going on here. And then I had to actually like go back again through the book um, to figure out what they were talking about. And that's when I discovered that they had actually never named a character, and the, the, but they named all the other characters related to him. And that's why I was confused is because there was this character that like, I was like, wait, I thought that guy died who's his relationship to who uh, you know uh, are they talking about this guy are they talking about some other guy oh they're talking about that guy you know it was it was confusing um if it weren't for that this would be a fine story it's uh you know got decent artwork and it's kind of uh on the darker side which is a plus in my book um but uh overall it has a sort of a moral i guess about like um about uh, looking after your elders because then when it's your turn um, to be cared for as an elder, people will look after you kind of a thing. Uh, that's kind of what it closes on. Um, but yeah, I was confused um, by this book's writing. So there's that. Alrighty. Um, the next one is Mommy, I Want to Sleep in Your Bed by uh, Harriet Zeifert, or Zeifert. I think I s had the same confusion of the pronunciation last time. I had another book by her, didn't I? Um, and pictures by Elliot Kreloff. Um, the pictures are the highlight of this book. Um, I'd say that this is probably neutral for me, like I'm getting into neutral books already. Um, the, the books have a very, or the, sorry, the pictures have a very childlike uh, style, um, and it's really charming. Um, the, I really like this character. Oh, I'm bumping my mic. Uh, I really like this character's like arms sticking out and their little facial expression and the way their feet go on the ground. And I don't know. It's just there's a lot of life to it and a lot of everybody's heads being kind of lopsided. Kind of makes these really cute expressions. Um, really adorable. And the colors are pretty nice. I think. Um, the story itself is pretty nondescript. You've got a kid who doesn't want to sleep in his own bed and wants to sleep in his parents' bed, um, but is constantly told that uh, he has to sleep in his own bed, and then it's just got a really charming ending where, uh, poor little crying kid, look at those tears, it's so cute. <laughs> I love the art style. Um, but uh, it he kind of solves his problem by um, tucking in his... Uh, rabbit and like modeling uh, the behavior that his parents modeled for him for um, a 
smaller thing and that kind of like helps him feel comforted and i think it helps the reader feel comforted so i thought it was kind of sweet um but you know not a terribly exciting story and a lot that goes on uh but you know sweet um Actually, I feel like I should have uh, put that one higher on my list than this one, Angel in Beijing, because uh, this book, my experience of it was, this book was inoffensive, but actively bored me. Um, this book is written by Belle Yang. It's called Angel in Beijing. Um, it's, I think, kind of a, let's see. Yeah, so it is kind of like an actual tour of Beijing, and I think that that's its strong point, is that it mentions actual landmarks in the city and things to do there and names them and stuff. Beihai Bei Park. And it talks about the Huaimei birds and uh, talks about Erhu. So it's it's got some interesting like introductions of cultural concepts um, while exploring a city, which should be fun. But for some reason, I just I think the writing was very nondescript. Um, art doesn't stand out to me too much. Uh, it's a story about a girl who finds a stray cat, I guess. And then she kind of loses that stray cat. Oh, this drawing is really nice, I thought. Um, she loses that stray cat, looks all around for him, eventually finds him, and uh, it's been readopted by another person who thinks that they found that stray cat, and the girl is nice and doesn't take the cat away, um, but comes to visit it regularly. And that's all that happens. Um, I think that uh, it could have been more compelling and maybe even more focused on the uh, ex explorations of the city instead of just kind of like bullet pointing those different places in the city and uh, could have been more engaging that way. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it didn't really uh, catch me or hold my interest. Okay, this one is called Doug Unplugged by Dan Yacharino. Yacharino? This is the person who wrote um, Giant Tess. Uh, this one isn't as appealing to me as Giant Tess, but it's probably just as well written. I just had a particular, uh, you know, special... Uh, uh, a particular interest in that um, subject matter of that book. Um, this one has a very like clear uh, sort of moral message. Um, it's about a robot who uh, he he gets plugged in to learn stuff because his parents want him to be smart. This is part of a series and they have a bunch of books like this. So he, he plugs in presumably to the internet in order to learn all sorts of stuff and um, and so he has all sorts of book smarts but then the book is about him uh, like he sees a pigeon and he realizes that there's things that he just finds out just by looking at a pigeon that he couldn't have learned from his books. So he unplugs from the internet and uh, goes throughout the city. And through doing so, he learns the um, sort of lived information about the things that he has book smarts about. So, you know, definitely like a, a message here. Um, of like, you know, you can learn a lot of things on the internet, which this is the nice thing. I feel like a lot of books are like this, like about unplugging or whatever, uh, are very uh, quick to shame people who use the internet. Like all these kids on their computers all day when we used to go outside in my day is kind of the vibe of a lot of those books. This one doesn't have that. This one is very, it doesn't uh, shame you for using the internet. It's It points out at, at the very beginning, like the premise of the book is that it points out uh, how much you can learn from the internet. There's lots of things you can learn from the internet. It just goes the extra mile of saying that uh, there's a lot of things that you can't learn from the internet. And it does a good job, I think, of uh, pointing out exactly what sorts of things it means by that. Um, and it uh, it basically just ends up being like a, a long list of the sort of uh, specific details that you wouldn't be able to learn from books that you can learn from living your life in the city. Um, Doug learned many more things about the city, like wet cement feels squishy under your feet, fire engine sirens are loud, some garbage cans are smelly, manholes are dark, pretty flowers grow out of cracks in the sidewalk, taxis stop if you raise your hand, you know, stuff like this. Uh, it's it's pretty exhaustive list. Uh, that's not true. What am I talking about? Exhaustive is totally the wrong word. It's not an exhaustive list. It's just a long list of, uh, a, a, you know, a pleasantly long list of things that you can learn um, uh, just through lived experience or or. Or, or at least not through a book. Um, and uh, so I think it makes its point uh, well. It makes... Uh, because of that. But um, overall, I don't know. You know, this guy's art style is very flat um, and sparse. And therefore, it doesn't have a ton to catch the eye. Other than, I guess, the colors I would find appealing. Um, and the story itself, I, I just don't... I'm, I'm bugged by messages flat out even if I agree with them and even if they're well well said I feel like generally speaking I, I would take a really well stated message for me to like a message in a kid's book I, I just I just prefer stories that don't have a strong message to them um and you know it's I don't know so 
I feel like there's good things and bad things about this book. It didn't feel particularly special to me, but uh, but it felt a, it felt a little bit like I could tell that it was built around a formula that had a message in mind more than uh, just being entertaining and just being a good story. Um, and that hurt it a little bit, but uh, but it, it it was it did well at what it set out to do. I feel like, which I I think is um, the most important thing in any critique. So, you know, may not have been my thing, but it was wasn't bad. The Story Blanket by Farida Wolf, um, Harriet May Savitz. I guess those are both the authors, um, and illustrated by Elena Odriazola. That's a fancy last name. Um, this book has some pretty charming character designs. You know. Uh, cute, cute little, uh, I don't know, like, they look like little wooden peg people for a board game, almost. Um, I like this girl's, uh, tiny sideways eyes, if you can see that. Um, anyways, uh, cute grandma. Uh, this, this story is, uh, I think it has, it's like a sweet story. Um, I, it wasn't, it's not particularly exciting. It's very, uh, a soft, understated story, um. But uh, it's a sweet one, so that's good. But not particularly exciting or interesting or funny um, or spooky or, you know, any things that I particularly like to see in a book. Um, so it didn't excite me, but it was good. Um, so it's about this uh, grandma who lives in a small town and tells stories to all the children in the town as they sit on her knitted blanket that she has. And then um, she realizes that, like, there are people in her town who are in need of things like mittens or hats or you know, various knitted things, but the snow is too thick, so she can't go into town for more wool, so she starts to unravel her story blanket in order to make everybody in her town these things. She gives them to them, she gives the gifts to them in secret, uh, so they're all wondering where it comes from, and then the children end up recognizing at the end that everybody's things, once they're all together, wait, that looks like the story blanket. Um, and then the people in the town give her yarn as gifts in thanks to make a new story blanket, um, and she does, and then I think it kind of implies at the end that she's going to repeat the story over again and make stuff for everybody. So, um, you know, I don't know. I guess it's maybe got a message here about, like, uh, sharing in a community and stuff, but it doesn't come across messagey to me. Um, it comes across more as a story. It, it's a story that seems worth telling. It, it's interesting enough to be a story. Um, could have been told in a somewhat more interesting way, in my opinion. Uh, usually I like calm books but this one was calm but not necessarily uh comforting or contemplative for it didn't it didn't stir anything in me uh but it might in you and um it's just kind of straightforward but you know interesting story nonetheless i feel like an interesting concept for a story so not bad just a gentle little book all right this next one is called memories of korea by uh not sure if it's Sung or Seong, uh, but that's the name. Uh, I'm going to say Sung Minyu. That's how I feel like I would pronounce that. Um, it's got this nice waxy cover. Uh, it's really dirty because it's, I don't know, must be a well-loved book from the library. It's got some dirt on it. But if it were new, I'm sure I would love that texture of that cover. Um, I think that waxy cover uh, texture that some books have is so nice. Um, I can't remember where I saw this illustration style before, but I must have reviewed somebody with uh, uh, something by this illustrator slash author before, because the art style looks vaguely familiar, familiar to me, or maybe I'm crazy. Um, it's cute. Uh, this book is really just a memoir. It's like a genuine, I think it's the actual memoir of the person writing the book, um, and it comes across that way at least. It has a little bit of Korean vocabulary in it, but the main focus is just so. So it's about um, this ex person's experience as a young girl who grew up uh, in the United States uh, with Korean parents, who goes back to visit family in Korea and is experiencing Korea for the first time as a young child, um, getting to know her uh, family members, including children uh, her age um, in Korea, and um, it's it's really very slice of lifey. It's all kind of. Uh, done from a first person perspective but with no dialogue so it's it's it really feels like a person telling you a story of a memory that they had rather than like a story that like brings you in and has like its own I don't know you know like there's a very big difference between books that sound like pure narration and books that are uh, dialogue heavy and this is that pure narration kind of style and it really has this sort of like like a story that you would hear from somebody in person um kind of feeling of just like what do you remember about you know, when you'd visited Korea as a child. 
I find that a very charming thing. I kind of appreciate this book, even though it doesn't um, like move me as a uh, like a as an interesting tale per se. It still is interesting to me as like a historical record, um, a snapshot of experience that is uh, that uh, lots of people could probably relate to, but at the same time is limited enough that it like is um, uh, I think interesting to to as something that you can have to share with people who haven't had that experience um there's a lot of uh sweet family moments in here like this uh she like talks about how much she loves having a bath that she's uh being given by her grandmother um yeah so it's it's charming it's really straightforward there's it's it's really just a series of scenes um i found it quite appealing so that's i think that's cool all right this one is called once i was a bear um, <clears throat> there's four more books. Uh, this is the first of my, like, positive, positive reviews. Uh, the books that I was really excited about. Um, uh, this one was one of my favorites based on story. So my top book this week, uh, I liked because of the story and the art. I like this one because of the story. Not as much about, as, not as much because of the art, but I still like the art. Um, and then the two in between, um, I like more because of the art and less because of the story. So um, this is one of my good story ones this week. Once I Was a Bear by Irene Luxbacher. Uh, I'm going to say it's Luxbacher, but I don't know for sure how that's pronounced. Um, so yeah, sweet art. I think that the character design is really strong. I'm not personally a fan of the, uh, I don't know what medium this is, but it looks like uh, probably digital painting. Um, I don't know. To me, I think that it would have been stronger if they'd lean into a, maybe a more digital style or um, if they just have it be actual traditional painting. Um, but that's just me. I just have a, a weird hang up around certain digital painterly styles. And the, you know, the composition is fabulous. Anyways, uh, so put simply, I guess, this book is the story of a bear being reincarnated into a human child um, from the perspective of the bear. And that's what I like about it. I feel like, well, first of all, I've never seen a kid's book that was talking about the experience of reincarnation. Uh, and it kind of just talks about that without even defining what reincarnation is or saying the word reincarnation. It just like throws you into this situation that's happening. Um, uh, but, uh, but I feel like of all things to do, if you were going to tell a story about reincarnation, I, I would have, uh, especially with a title like Once I Was a Bear, I expected it to be from the point of view of the human child, which, like, I guess technically it is because it's the same character, but it's very much told from the perspective, I, I felt, of somebody who, um, like, is kind of retaining their bear identity primarily, uh, which was a really interesting take. Uh, so, yeah, Once I Lived in a Forest of Tall Trees, I'm going to just read a little bit for you. I splashed in cool, rushing rivers and climbed mighty mountains. Um, my whole world fluttered and hopped and skipped and soared. This is probably the best illustration of the book. This cute little thing. Look at that. Um, rest and play day after day. I was never afraid. But then my nose smelled change in the air. Time to curl up in my earthy den and dream. I woke up in a different kind of wilderness. So it's not strictly reincarnation as in death and rebirth, I guess. Although maybe... Um, actually, this is even crazier now that I'm thinking about it. It actually doesn't imply reincarnation. It just Im implies that the bear fell asleep one day and then woke up as a human, but they've got this whole life. However, the life is shown with them being a bear in the photos, but I'm, or the pictures, but I'm pretty sure that that's, uh, metaphorical or something. I, <laughs> I don't know. Um... Anyways, the, it gives all of these details. One of the things I liked about the writing of this book is it gives a lot of details that are just... Um, I, I really glossed over them when I was reading before. Those weren't... the That wasn't the full text I was reading, obviously. I was just reading, like, one sentence per page to give you a kind of an idea of what was happening. But the I probably should have done more um, justice to the writing style because what I love is that there's a lot of um, little details in here. Rest and play day after day. A bright circle in the sky led the way as I roamed from one adventure to another. Um, and then here again, once he's turned into a kid, splashing and rambling, tumbling and thumping would have to wait. I gulped down my berries in a hurry. It's, um, 
it moves along at a nice pace. Uh, it's got a rhythm to it, but at the same time, there's like details, uh, personality to the writing, uh, interesting word choices, interesting details to focus on that I felt really gave a lot of life to this and a lot of poetry to it. Mentions that butterflies fluttered in my stomach, and I guess that's kind of part of this thing that uh, they talk about the experience, like what it felt like to suddenly wake up and be a kid uh, instead of a bear, and and that feels like it's very much like it's not somebody who like is just a kid who feels like they were once a bear. It's like, this is a bear experiencing what it was like to have transformed, and it focuses on the feeling of that transformation, which is so interesting to me. Um, and it's really just never explained, which makes it even more interesting to me. In this new world, tall towers replace tall trees. Loud sounds, ringing, shouting, honking, roared around me. You know, all these details, it's nice. Um, and so the bear goes to uh, preschool. Man, I just feel like this is the kind of fantasy that I would have had when I was a kid. Like, what would it be like if a bear woke up in my body uh, or if I was a bear and I woke up in my body um, just like tomorrow, like how would the world look? Uh, what would it feel like? Um, I feel like I remember having that kind of fantasy when I was a child and just like going through and seeing all of the things in my normal life from a and how strange and surprising they would be if they were seen from a deeply different perspective from mine. Um, so I thought it was really cool to see this kind of thing explored in a kid's book. I feel like... Um, it felt like it, it dragged up some like the like the type of fantasy that a child has for me or that I had as a child, um, and it was it's a kind of kind of a thought process I hadn't thought about in a really long time. So there was this really mystical quality to me, and like they they got something about me that even I had forgotten um, <laughs> that I used to get. Uh, so that was super cool. In the end, I guess the bear kind of like has uh, like identifies comes to identify with the human experience and still retains some of its bearishness. Um, I felt ready to shed my fur, it says in the end, and jump and hop and skip and soar on a new adventure. It just accepts that it's on a new adventure now. Like, man, you could make this into a movie, you know what I mean? Because once I was a bear. And by the end, they've turned fully into a human. I don't know. I just found this so compelling. There's so much mystery to this. There's so much unexplained um, qualities to this story. And it's said with uh, there's just so much... Um, soul and personality into the writing that you almost really believe the the it, 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 you know it suspends your disbelief really successfully and uh, I was really excited by that there's I, I want that book there's so much cool things about that um okay this one is called when spring comes to the DMZ by um Ok Bay Lee I think is how I want to pronounce that you tell me and um as you might be able to see from the cover alone the appeal of this book is primarily the artwork. The story is good, but the artwork is amazing. Um, this is the story, or less of a story, more of a narration, I suppose. Um, it's talking about uh, the seasons. It's not just spring. It goes through the different seasons and what life, uh, like not human life, but uh, but nature is like uh, in the demilitarized zone between South Korea and North Korea. Um, throughout the year and the different seasons as the animals have their various life cycles and stuff like that. Uh, told sort of from the perspective, well, of a grandchild, but as a grandchild uh, acting sort of as the mouthpiece for uh, their grandfather, who um, has memories of Korea before uh, that division and has a lot of nostalgia for it and wishes that uh, he could go back to the demilitarized zone. There's this... Um, this abandoned uh, rusty train that you can see in the demilitarized zone that um, I just, I don't know why, is probably my favorite thing about the illustrations. Um, I just really feel like it's got this, there's this like uh, chunkiness to all the illustrations that's just so appealing. Um, it sort of has a character design philosophy even to the environment, um, not just to the characters themselves uh, the or the character design philosophy that they're using for the characters uh, bleeds over into the design philosophy for the plants, the trees, the train, everything in the story, um, which is something that reminds me of, like, it has a similar charm to me of, I'm a big fan of Bill Peet's drawings, and it has uh, that, that, those drawings also have that similar charm, um, but this uh, has this uh, sort of thick, waxy line quality to everything that makes it even more charming and appealing to me than Bill Peet's work. Um, and it's pretty much just a lot of beautiful nature drawings. Um, I mean, I just want to show you every page in this book, but you should really just get it for yourself. Um, there's a little bit of, um, you know, the darker side too. It's not all just focusing on the beauty of nature, which is, of course, makes sense. Um, but it's mostly just focused on the beauty of nature. Um, here's more 
uh, soldier stuff. So it's so it uh, it doesn't shy away from the reality of it, and it uh, it's a snapshot of a place um, that I didn't know that much about, and I feel like it's very it feels very authentic. It feels very detailed, and it feels um, like a a really great way to present this information about this different you know a part a part of the world that's uh, different to people in my part of the world, and I think it would be a great way to talk about different parts of the world in a United States classroom. Um, I don't know, there's something so charming about the line quality here. I feel like there's also something very Maurice sendak -y about the, specifically the line quality. You know, some of Maurice Sendak's uh, drawings that have more of that, like, thicker pencil feeling line kind of reminds me of that. So great. Um, in the middle of the book, there's this, or not the middle of the book, at the end of the book, there's this gigantic spread. Oh my goodness. And this is where uh, some of the images on the covers are from. So you know that they know exactly what to focus on like this is a book primarily about the art I feel and it's just so good um, and it has a really uh, you know a bittersweet quality to it of uh, the nostalgia of the grandfather being a theme throughout this and how you know uh, the, what do the final pages say grandfather wants to fling the tightly locked gates open because this is grandfather's beloved home country you know it's sad it's beautiful um, it's factual it's matter of fact uh, and it's informative. What more can you ask? It's great. Um, and there is even is uh, detailed uh, information as sort of an author's note in the back of the book. So highly recommend this one. Thought it was really great. Okay, this one is called "Some Things I've Lost" by uh, Sibel Sibele Young. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that first name. Um, Okay, so this one doesn't really have a story. Uh, it seems more like it, it almost comes across as uh, like a book that you would buy at a gallery show that was sort of like a retrospective on that gallery show or like a souvenir of a gallery show. I don't know if there was a show that went with it, but uh, it has that vibe. There's not really a story here at all. Um, the, the words, the text, simply consist of the words figure one, object, roller skate, last scene, basement, obstacle course, stuff like that. Figure three, object, wristwatch, last scene, kitchen, top drawer with the elastic bands. You get the idea. Um, you probably can't see it because of the glare and the distance, um, but uh, each page has a image of the item that was lost. And um, and it appears to be made out of paper craft or maybe felt, maybe it's felt craft or maybe it's a mix. Um, anyways, uh, obviously if it were just these images, it wouldn't be that exciting of a book. Um, there's a lot of items in here. The exciting thing, oh, it's just so exciting to me. I mean, I, I can barely contain my excitement, but I don't even know how to express it, uh, cause it might be really particular to me. I mean, not particular to me, of course, but like it might not be as universal as I think. But, uh, as you pull out these pages, um, the item is sort of, I don't want to say it transforms, but it's sort of played with, uh, it's the, the spread uh, becomes sort of a series of sculptures inspired by the lost item, is how I would put it. Some of them are smaller and simple, so it gives, and some of them are larger, so it gives the impression of maybe some sort of transformation, but I really just feel like it's sort of riffing on the concept. Um, and they all kind of take on these dramatic organic forms, um, many of which have, maybe all of which have some sort of uh, aquatic theme, many of which... Uh, some of them are sort of like plants, but many of them are sort of invertebrates of some kind. I don't think that it's a transformation. I think that the, I think that these are various things for a scene that are all derived from the concept of the original image, um, because you can see in the back that they kind of do end up making a scene together. And there you can see a lot of the things from the book, and they do kind of seem to be an underwater reef scene of some kind. Oh my goodness, I, I wish I could show you every single image in this book, uh, but it really would take too much time and it's hard to hold up those spreads. Um, so I'm just going to leave you to get this book from the library or purchase it yourself. I certainly will be purchasing it myself um, because some of the art is absolutely fantastic. If I had any critique about this book, I would say um, that I wish it were like a giant art book where I could just look at the pictures on the pages and not have to like unfold the spreads. That seems a bit ungainly and it's just so easy to damage spreads um, that fold out like that. Um, 
so that's a little bit of a hassle to me, but it's not enough to hurt the fact that this is a book that, uh, for somebody who is interested in uh, sculpture and is interested in uh, biology, particularly aquatic biology and invertebrate biology, um, and fantasy biology, this thing kind of just combines everything. It combines fantasy biology, you know, invertebrate bi biology, sculpture, and in the most exciting way, the colors, the shapes, the textures of the felt and paper, it's all so good. So yeah, I love that. Okay, here's my top book for this week. It is Crow Boy by Taro Yashima. I highly reviewed uh, previously, I reviewed another Taro Yashima book, and I thought uh, a lot of that as well. Uh, I love this guy. Um, I want to read more of his books if there are some, so I'll be looking into that. Um, once again, it's a Caldecott honor book, and, uh, you know, I finally am starting to have to admit that uh, that these Caldecott honors, you know, I, I never really particularly put much credence on awards or medals. Uh, that They don't really matter to me. I don't really notice whether they're there or not. Plenty of the books that I love don't have them, so I never thought that much of them. But as I've been getting these books from the library and reviewing them, I've been noticing more and more that a lot of my top books for the weeks are Caldecott Honor. So maybe that medal actually means something to me, and maybe I should actually start uh, getting books and trying to read them based on that uh, medal. So that surprised me. Um... All right, so uh, first things first, I guess, I want to point out that the art style is amazing. It's really similar. In fact, it, even the colors are similar to uh, the, the last book that I read by him. Uh, these pinks and yellows and blues. What exciting color combinations. And the way that they're used in this sort of like, I don't know, this fuzzy, there's this fuzzy quality to it that almost makes it feel like half-remembered memories. Um, but the the result is, makes for some really gorgeous pages. Um, obviously, my favorite is that one because I love bugs. Oh my goodness, how beautiful is that? Uh, and these rich blacks that he, like, you know, quote unquote blacks that he makes out of just crossing, uh, cross hatching the colors that he uses elsewhere is also such a great effect. Um, so it's got this, yeah, it's got this like vibrating, blurry quality that I just love. Um, anyways, this is a story about. Uh, uh, just a weird kid. Um, as a weird kid myself, I always appreciate these types of stories. Um, this is probably the best weird kid story that I've ever read. A lot of them come across as a little bit like from the perspective of an outsider saying like, hey, it's okay to be weird. It's like, yeah, we know. This one, I don't know. I guess it is, it, this one is explicitly from the perspective of an outsider. It's actually narrated in the first person by one of the weird kid's classmates. Um, but, uh, but it feels much more um, documentarian than uh, making any kind of commentary it's just showing that this i mean there's a message that it's okay to be weird but it's sort of implied it's not stated outright um and and uh much less directly implied too it just kind of states the facts here's what happened and you get the sense that this might really be a real story just like his other book that i read um and um and you kind of come to your own conclusion that being weird is okay um rather than feeling like the book is trying to convince you of it you know um so it starts out with just a, a kind of documenting how this kid is weird he was left alone in the study time he was left alone in the play time he was always at the end of the line always at the foot of the class a forlorn little tag along soon chibi began to make his eyes cross-eyed so that he was not so he was able not to see whatever he did not want to see um and Chibi found many ways, one after another, to kill time and amuse himself. Just the ceiling was interesting enough for him to watch for hours. The wooden top of his desk was another thing interesting to watch. Um, so the focus of this kid's weirdness is that he uh, observes things and finds interest in things that most people would consider uh, sort of uh, unimportant or not worth noticing. Um, they do focus a lot uh, in little details about how this kid is bullied for this, which is kind of interesting. Um, he's implied to be maybe a very poor kid from out in the countryside. Um, but yeah, he just notices all these small things in life, uh, and he's observant, but I, it's not that people don't notice that he's observant. I think it's just that people don't see the things that he is observing to be worth observing. These little tiny boring details like, yeah, that's there, but it's not interesting. And that's kind of the thing that makes him weird is that he does find boring things interesting. Um, but in listing all of the things that he finds interesting, there was just a really, uh, beautiful, calm, meditative quality to me that as I was reading it, I felt like I was, um, being asked to meditate on these details myself and find the beauty in them myself. And there was a really calming effect to reading that, um, that made me feel more aware of my environment and, uh, and more, uh, appreciative of the beauty of the simple things in my life and the world around me and 
I mean, it was simple but really effective at doing that, and that was a really enjoyable experience, so I loved reading it. Um, and then it turns out that uh, he, well, he, he gets a teacher who appreciates him for all of the things that he does well, and he starts to tack up Chibi, the boy's drawings, um, and on the wall, and they show some of his drawings and uh, also his writing. He liked Chibi's own handwriting, which no one but Chibi could read, and he tacked that up on the wall. You know, so he has a teacher that appreciates him, and uh, there's some really just cute moments with that. Um, and the teacher uh, has him go to the talent show, and everybody's like, what can this kid do? And it turns out that the teacher bothered to notice that uh, Chibi can actually do perfect imitations of all these different crows because he observes these things and lives in the countryside where there's a ton of crows. Um, and then there's this amazing section of the story where uh, it describes the emotions and the experience of the people listening to his performance of the crows where they are brought in to almost a first-hand experience through the uh, veracity of his imitations um, of his country life and of what the world is like to him. And, um, and they all kind of have experienced this massive wave of empathy um, that is illustrated in the illustrations through like actual drawings of the landscape that he lives in uh, that they are kind of empathizing with the experience of. Um, and like they're in tears and they all respect him after that, you know, happy ending, wrap it up. Uh, but, but man, there's just some writing that was just so evocative in all these different ways, you know, like really feeling, it, it made me feel like I was noticing my breath. Like it made me feel like I was hearing the birds around me. It made me feel uh, calm and almost, <laughs> seems melodramatic, but like holy. It, there was a holy moment reading this book to me. <laughs> Is that too much to say? Uh, I liked it. Okay, so uh, those are all the books that I had this week. Um, check them out if you want to, and uh, I'll see you again in uh, the future. So thanks for watching. Bye.